Amen. So what did you get for Christmas? No, I'm kidding. Have a seat. Yes, but I, I'm wearing a robe, and uh, I actually have a reason for wearing a robe today. We, we're going to do a passage that's talking about God's glory. And one of the things that a robe was supposed to provide for the, the person leading a service was that, that indication that what they were talking about was elevated, was, I don't know, and then we did our Mr. Bean impression, and I kind of feel like there's a way in which the reality is that every one of us has the capacity to hear God's voice in Scripture and to help one another learn. But today, I'm going to start off on the, the platform up here, which is something we don't do. And I'm wearing a robe, which is something Tim will not be caught doing in fact, I decided that if you want to resuscitate Tim, who's in a coma, you know, like, try putting a robe on him, because that will take care of it like that, I'm pretty sure. Nonetheless, um, Jude's focus in today's passage is the glory of God, and I'd like you to come along with me as we look at this passage of Scripture, and normally we have another, we have another reader but this morning, you and I are going to be the readers. So if you are able, why don't you join me in standing? Normally, I'd point you to the page number in the Pew Bible, but this morning, let's just read the, the passage off the screen. And we're going to be reading Jude verses 24 and 25. It concludes this letter that Jude is writing. Now, <clears throat> this is your opportunity to shine compared to first service. So, when I say we're going to read it together, my, my hope is that we're actually going to read it together. And so, when I start, I'd like you to start with me. We ready for that? All right. I'm liking this already. Okay, so to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy... To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for reading along with me. Please enjoy a seat. So as we conclude our, our series from Jude... Uh, there was enough difficult stuff in Jude that we extended it longer than we intended to. And that's just the, the reality of the situation because some of what Jude's saying is kind of difficult and needed a little more chewing. And so I want to go back to Jude verse 1 and remind us where we started. Verse 1 says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. And you go, well, that doesn't sound hard. I like those verbs. We've got called, we've got loved, we've got kept. I like all of those very much. Thank you very much, Mike. But Jude's got more to say. Well, connected in God for Jesus the Messiah, that also sounds good, Mike. Yeah, but as we continued to move through Jude's letter, we found some things that were a little more difficult. He moved from, I'm writing to you who are in Christ, to his reason for writing, which is, guess what? There are already bad influences in your congregation, and I've got to warn you about it. So in Jude verse 4, he says, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago, ouch, have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Now, if you've been with us this month, you may remember some of the difficult issues that Pastor Tim has dealt with in a few verses from this short letter. If you haven't been with us, welcome. Uh, if you want to get caught up, don't do it right now, but you can go to the website and there are links to 
the sermon videos and podcasts there, and uh, you could get some context for what I'm going to talk about today, which is our text, which is what's called a doxology. Doxologies are all about giving glory to God. Now, if you've been churched, what does the word doxology evoke in your mind? Does anybody, what's your immediate response? Come on, praise God. Anything else? Thank you. Helena is picking me up. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Like, that is the doxology. Now, if you're not church, you have no idea what Helena and I are talking about, and that's okay too. But there's a way in which we miss something by saying, oh, that's the doxology, because that's not the doxology. There are a bunch of doxologies in Scripture. Now, they all have to do with praising God, giving Him glory. They're common in both the Hebrew Scriptures and in the New Testament. So, let me give you one from the Hebrew Scriptures, Psalm 29. It begins this way, ascribe, which means acknowledge, recognize to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Okay, so the psalmist is singing and he's telling angels to acknowledge the greatness of God, as though angels needed to be reminded, right? So, what's he doing? He's reminding the whole congregation, this is our job. We're joining the angels. We are acknowledging God's greatness. We're giving him praise. It's important to remember that God doesn't need our praise. God was fine before he made us. He doesn't need our praise. And yet, in his grace, And in his willingness to pursue us, he's made it possible for people like us to know him well enough to praise him for what's amazing about him. In the history of uh, the nation of Israel called Chronicles, we've got David praising the Lord, and it's a a, a little easier maybe to, to understand than asking angels to sing. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, God, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and we praise your glorious name. It's like Eastern effusiveness. It feels a little weird coming off my tongue as a Westerner, individualistic, don't have a king who I want to celebrate, uh, have never had a king who I'd want to celebrate in terms like this. So, how do I connect with that? The beauty, the beauty of the New Testament is we find out how to connect with that. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13 that we get to join in the praise because of what Jesus has done for us. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, So the way has been cleared, access to God, which was so far and high and distant, it's still holy like that. It's still superior like that. It's still majestic like that. But in Christ, there's an accessibility that never existed before. Paul does a doxology in his uh, letter to Rome, uh, the Roman church, giving God credit for being able to establish his people in the gospel of Jesus. So, from Romans chapter 16, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. Paul is talking about something that this group of people didn't create for themselves. 
They didn't form the basis on which their faith lives. This is done by God and purposefully and for our benefit. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul focuses on something else, on what God is doing within his people because of Jesus' completed work. Now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. God's power isn't just an establishing, it's a sustaining thing. It's a thing that's going to move people closer into connection. And because of that connection, I don't have to wear a robe and be special. I get to be one of many people in this room who by the grace of Jesus Christ, connects me with a perfect, holy God in whose presence I have no basis to stand other than the mercy of Christ. What we find as we comb through these expressions of God's glory in each of these different letters is that the writers aren't just saying, glory to God. They're emphasizing that glory in aspects of God's character that relate to the point that they're making in the letter. So it's not just, oh, it's time for a doxology, God is great. It's, here's how God's greatness relates to what I've been talking about. Paul has these amazing digressions in his letters where all of a sudden he was making an argument and he falls into a doxology talking about how wonderful and great God is. And there's a way in which that's really hopeful because it's saturating every part of what Paul is talking about. The easy stuff, the hard stuff, all points him to God's greatness. All right, so all of that as background on doxologies that aren't that little tune, we come to Jude's conclusion of a letter that honestly has been a bit rough. Um, I'm not going to lie about that. And he does something I was trying to figure out, how, how can I explain this to you? And then something happened this week. So my family went to a Silomar um, over the last few days. So we're in Pacific Grove, and uh, a Silomar is a thing, it's a place that originally was a YWCA camp. It was established about 100 years ago, and oddly enough, uh, the room that we were staying in, which is on the budget side of their accommodations, the insulation is at least 100 years old, if there is any insulation, and we were cold. I never get cold, and I had two coats on. My daughter always wears shorts, and she got a huggle for Christmas, which is like a bigger Snuggie, I guess. I, I, and she was wearing it the, the whole weekend because it was cold. Even in our room, it was cold. Could we get the picture of uh, a Silomar so we can evoke it? It's a wonderful beach looking, and it's cold, 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 like Jude's letter. And I'm walking around the room, and all of a sudden I realize, wow, I'm not that cold right now. And I tried to figure out why it was. You know, sunlight, no, absolutely wasn't that. Did, did I add a coat and not notice? No. And it turned out that behind a chair was a heat register, and there was just a tiny trickle, just a little gasp of warm air that was flowing out of there, and it was just enough to take the edge off. So my analogy here is verses 24 and 25 of Jude's letter are like the little warm bit of air that comes in and says, even though Jude totally interrupted what he was going to write about because he was concerned about the teachers who had infiltrated these churches that he's writing to, and he's got some cold, cold news for, for these folks, it's warmed up by these last two verses. It's warmed up, and it changes how we experience the whole letter if we let his clothes relate to the rest of the passage. It's the warmth that makes the cold reality appropriate and livable. So these infiltrators with another agenda coming into the church, one can imagine people in the church, or maybe some of us as we heard it read, responding with something like, well, I know my motives aren't always right. Am I one of the people that Jude is talking about? And in these two verses, 
I think Jude does an amazing job of saying God is so powerful, so glorious, so authoritative, he can keep you in the way that you need to be kept. He can keep you the way you need to be kept. So that's great. Jude's writing this letter, but I got to tell you, we have a different cultural understanding of who God is and the role that he plays in our lives. So, uh, so some of my family, we were watching a football game yesterday, and after the game, uh, the coach said a couple of things that, that I noticed, and the first was he used the word dead gummit, which uh, made me laugh. I'm still laughing about that one. Um, but later, he's talking about the, the win, and he, he gave God glory for his team's victory. I am not going to say that God is indifferent to how a debate turns out, or how a war turns out, or even how a football game turns out. I think God is interested all the way down to the nitty-gritty of everybody's lives. But at the same time, there's a way in which, even if it's true that somehow God's glory was on display in that football game, it kind of falls short of the real glory of God, doesn't it? There's a way in which that comes off as a little trite, and maybe it's culturally appropriate. Maybe because what we're looking for is somebody who's going to intervene in the stuff that we want to be doing and helps us fulfill our destiny in some way that we like. And so I want to share a video clip from an ad that I've been seeing uh, for a product called Mirror, which you may or may not have seen. Live. Welcome back to the mirror. You've got this, John. And on demand. It's bar. Boxing. Strength. Cardio. Yoga. And more. It's an interactive. Relax your shoulders, Dan. Goal crushing. Keep that heart rate up. Whole family. Whole body fitness machine. You've got this, Dan. Stop slumping your shoulders. You know, like, uh, so what this device is, it's a thing you put in your room, and then you go do the kind of workout that you want, and there's somebody on the other end who's going to give you feedback about how it goes. So you pick when you go in the room. You pick the kind of workout you're going to do, and then you decide how much you're going to take their input on board. And I think this is exactly how a lot of the people I know, how God works. I'm not that interested, somebody might say, in what God has to say about me and my life, but oh wait, the wheels came off a little bit, and now I'm going to go into my room with my God mirror, and I'm going to listen to what the coach says about the stuff that I want to know about. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Somebody came up to me after the first service and said, yep, got me. Not always, but that's what I default to. I've had enough input right now, thanks God. I'm going to leave the room with my spiritual mirror in it. And there's a way in which that makes God feel safe. And I think it's important for us to remember what Jude has been saying this whole time is that God is not safe. God is powerful. He's epically powerful. He's outside space and time, and yet he created space and time and us and has a purpose for us, and what he says to us matters, and it should matter, and we ought not turn off the input because it's not, he's not there to coach us. He's got something bigger in mind. The worst thing about that is that when I moved from the IT world into the pastoring world, a lot of my friends from my other context, I think their understanding of what I do has to do with that mirror version of God. So they think that I've got some kind of a faux spiritual thing where I, my do-gooding gets better and my do-batting gets less. And isn't that nice for you, Mike, is kind of the default response. Because there's no sense 
in their cultural awareness of who God is, that God is bigger than what I get to decide to do or not to do, that God is bigger than my preferences, that God is bigger than my current situation and has plans outside of mine that matter. So, what does Jude say? He says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. All right, well, the mirror can't do that. And if you'd like a comical, you know, impression, me doing yoga in front of the mirror, um, stumbling will be involved, okay? Not that flexible, not that graceful, not that elegant, and no amount of coaching is going to change that anytime soon. All the mirror can do is say, get up and try harder. And that's not what the God of the Bible says. It doesn't say, get up and try harder. You're slumping your arms. You're slumping your shoulders, Mike. Now, the real God of the Bible is more important than that. He's more glorious than that. He's more involved than that. He's the God who keeps. So, keep you from stumbling. The the word used in this verse means guards. So, God is guarding those who are in Christ. I don't know about you, but that helps me because... I kind of suck, to be honest, and I need help to avoid stumbling. I am absolutely capable of stumbling all the time. What kind of stumble is Jude talking about, though? He's talking about what has happened with these teachers infiltrating and teaching wrong things out of wrong motives, and he's saying, look, those of you who are in Christ, he's going to ensure that you stick with him. So, pursue him. And as you deepen your relationship with Christ, you're going to notice the false teachers and their false motives. Now, just a few verses before, in verse 21, Jude says to keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Same English word keep, but you'll notice that there's a different actor in this one. So, keep yourselves. I'm supposed to keep myself in this verb. In God's love. Okay, well, what does that mean? It's a different Greek word, and it it means to watch. So, this verse is saying, watch and wait, Christian, because God in his love will continue to develop you as you continue to engage with him through King Jesus King. Why do I say King Jesus King? Because this, this verse says, Lord Jesus Christ. And we say it a lot King Jesus King here, if you haven't been around since the last time that we uh, explained it, or if you have only been around since the last time we explained it, Lord is a translation of a Greek word that means anything from sir to emperor. And so, to a, a Gentile mind, that word means king, ruler, leader, boss of me. That's not a sense that I get from Lord. But I've had to learn it because that's what the text says. And that the Christ part isn't his last name. What that is is a Greek word that stands in for a Hebrew word that means Messiah. And Messiah is a coming king of the Hebrew nation. So, what the writers are saying when they say, Lord Jesus Christ, king of Gentiles, king of Jews, one person, ruler over all. So, it's not mentorship, it's not coaching that we get from Jesus, who's king of Gentiles and king of Jews alike. It's the mercy of a king whose character is perfect. Oh, to have a king whose character is perfect. But I digress. What what does God accomplish by keeping his people from stumbling? Jude continues, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Man, without fault? Me? How is that possible? We always say, we get the life that Jesus lived. He paid for the life that we're actually living when we're in him. If you've read the rest of Jude, you might be anxious about what might happen given that there are infiltrators in the church, ready to mislead with false teaching, but that's not Jude's point at all. Into that cold danger blows this warm wind of God's presence, one that's safe, 
for those who are in Jesus, Messiah, our King. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord. How confident is Jude of this being taken care of by God's power and plan? He says, before all ages, now and forevermore. I don't know. Forevermore sounds a little bit too Edgar Allan Poe for me. The original language says something like this. Before all time, both now and into all ages. What Jude is saying is, there's this thing that's been happening forever, and it's the great God has had a plan for your connection with him, and that's empowered by the work of Christ Jesus, that the on-ramp to that connection with God is Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. So if you're a Christ follower, God has got this. If you're a Christ follower, God has expanded your view of reality from what should I do differently in 2020 to what did the God of forever want me to do today? Oh. And I should disclaim this for a moment. If you need to watch your food intake in 2020, I mean, go ahead and do that. If you need to get your exercise up, even if it involves a mirror, okay, fine. If you need to get better sleep, like my children probably do, yep, I'm for that. But if that's as far as your planning for 2020 goes, I think you might be missing some things. Don't make the mistake of not thinking about God's big plan for your life. He's not your spiritual mirror saying, yeah, you're doing a good job, Dad Gummit. Just keep it up. Keep going. So, where do I direct you instead? Jude's letter has actually pointed us to a number of places. And there are three categories that I want to give you. And what I want to do is just remind those of you who are here of what Tim, some of Tim's, uh, you know, tweetable sayings were. And also, if you haven't been here, to just give you a summary of what's going on. Jude points to Scripture. Jude points to godliness. And Jude points to transformation that God produces in his own. So, Jude directs us to the truth and value of Scripture one of the things that we said was the Word of God is living and active, and yet it does not change. So it's secure. It's unchanging, even though the way it takes shape in us continues to change. The Word is living and active, but we don't experience that unless we put it into practice. Okay, so it's going to be active to the extent that I do something about it. All right, the Word of God becomes more alive to us as we obey the God of the Word. Those last two create a loop. So, I obey and I see more. I see more, I obey it, I see more. And there's a way in which the Word comes alive it, it, it could never have if I weren't putting it into practice. What God communicates in Scripture is more important than what you and I feel or think. Most people don't like that one because what I feel and think, those are my criteria, right, for understanding what's good and bad in my life. But Scripture says, no, God has an eternal standard that we're looking at instead of what my feelings or my thoughts are in the moment. The will of God is revealed in the Word of God written by the Spirit of God. If you were there that week, you heard that several times. We want to teach our people the Bible, not teach the Bible to people. And that's a thing. The whole point there is that to the extent that I know you and you know me, we're going to have a better communication about what's going on in the Scripture and in each other's lives. And that's one of the reasons that we've got community group signups today, because life on life is something that takes learning the Bible from a, a, a solo activity to something where other people can hold us accountable, other people can make observations about what's going on in our life that sometimes we don't see. It's good stuff because perseverance happens as the Spirit leads us. 
illuminates God's word and gives us the faith to trust and obey God's will for our lives. All right, Jude also directs us away from ungodliness. Tim said early on that ungodly can mean without worship. And uh, Karen is here, I think. Would you say that I drive worshipfully? No. Like, so for me, the way Scripture is reading me is, why, Mike, do you feel okay being unworshipful in the mentality that you have, in the approach that you have, in the response that you have to other people's driving? Why is that okay? And it's something that I'm grappling with, and I'm not seeing a ton of victory at the moment, to be perfectly honest. But it's on my radar because I've been grappling with it ever since Tim said it. Here's another thing. Heresy isn't just false teaching. It's emphasizing the wrong thing. Oh, that hurts too because there are so many things to get excited about that aren't the main thing. And as soon as we start escalating them beyond their importance, they become causes for division. They become skewed in their own way. They become problems. And to grumble is to say God's grace isn't sufficient. And I did that in traffic only yesterday. How about you? Fortunately, God transforms his own. So Jude directs us to this transformation that happens when the gospel of Jesus Christ takes root in us. The Holy Spirit does not divide, but unifies in the gospel. The Holy Spirit doesn't divide us, unifies us in the gospel. Everything we do that is good and pleasing to God is because he gave us the ability, the motivation, the desire, and the belief to do so. So I don't get credit for any good thing that I do. Isn't that amazing? Yay! Okay, but if I'm doing it for my own motives, then I'm following suit with the false teachers that he's been complaining about the whole time. So I need to be on God's agenda, especially as somebody who's standing up here, whether I've got a robe on or not. The solution to our sin problem is to embrace Christ as our identity. I'm, I'm, I'm going out of order here. We have a sin problem. We're born into this world wanting our own way, and the solution to that is to embrace Christ as our hope, as our identity. I want to be like Jesus. And then finding our identity in anyone or anything other than Jesus is the problem. Being in Christ is not a makeover but a takeover. My spiritual mirror is never going to make a difference fundamentally in how I respond to other drivers. Nobody's ever going to say to me, why can't you just let that person cut you off and have me go, you're right, absolutely right. I should feel like I'm going to die every time I get out in the car. My brain's never going to work that way. But what God can do is say, Mike, you got grace you didn't deserve. You are living in the warmth of that grace. Why are you unwilling to extend it to somebody else who did one thing wrong that you know of? Oh, oh okay. Yes, yes, Lord. When we're secure in Christ, we can admit sin, which I guess I'm trying to model this morning, and confess our continued sin. It's not like I just started being disgruntled with other drivers. It's not like I've got a short temper if you're being obnoxious on the road and that just sprang up yesterday. Those called by God are set apart by the Father for the Son and are kept for the Son. So fundamentally, my problem is not, how do I remain attached? My problem is, how do I show my Savior the love that he deserves? How do I worship God in the way that somebody so beyond my understanding deserves? Well, I do that as light is illuminated in my mind as I read Scripture and as people suggest how they're doing it. And I get to say, together, God is using our interaction 
to transform us. We contend for the truth of the person, work, teaching, and deity of Jesus Christ. That doesn't just go for people teaching here, although that's of primary importance here. That means that everybody who's really part of what's going on at COV has to say at some level, I don't know everything, as none of us do, but I want to be about that. So, if you're going to focus on something to watch and wait, like Jude said in verse 21, those would be areas where I'd direct you toward living out the truth of Scripture, away from ungodliness as it's identified in your life, and in celebration of the gospel that doesn't leave us where we are.